do it with passion or not at all. Because I think when you're not passionate about something, it's not fun. And so why do something and why put in 80 hours a week into something that you don't actually enjoy? Welcome to the Passion Behind the Art Show. It's all about diving in with individuals to learn the story behind their passion. It's your host, Daryl Pinnock. What's up? What's up? It's another week, another amazing person, another amazing story. And I can't wait to share this week's episode. But before we jump into that, I just want to remind you to learn everything that's going on with the podcast and all that I'm doing. Go to Passion Behind the Art, A R T dot com. That's Passion Behind the Art dot com to learn about everything that we are doing and what's going on with the podcast and what's the next moves. And of course, episode 100 is coming and I can't wait. Can't wait. Can't wait. So, without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. All right, well, I am beyond excited to have Alana Griffo on the Passion Behind the Art Show. Alana, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm glad to have you on. I've just seen you just ever since you released this book. Um, it's just I've just been seeing you constantly, constantly. So um, whatever you're doing is working because I'm seeing you a lot. Thank you. I'm so excited about it. And I'm so excited to talk. <laughs> All right. So let's jump right into it. How did it get started? How did Alana's journey start? I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. So I feel really lucky. I knew I wanted to be an artist from a very young age. And I had an older sister kind of pave the way for me. Uh, she's a glass blower, so obviously we took very different art degrees. Um, but I just always, I loved design. I wanted to do interior design or graphic design, and I took my first type class, mm. and I was like, this is it. <laughs> so I really had a pretty clear, like, I knew what I wanted to do from the get-go. So I feel really fortunate that I found my passion really early on. Awesome, awesome. So, you you were always wanted to do design, like um, from the beginning. Like, did you go to college for it? Did you go to college? For yeah. School? Okay. Yep, I went to RIT and I studied graphic design. And then when I graduated, I actually became an adjunct professor oh, at nice. RIT in the school that I graduated from. Uh, I only did one semester because that is hard. <laughs> it's really hard work. Uh, but I yeah I went to school for it and loved it. Uh, that's um, Rochester. Yeah. Institute of Technology. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. That's. I a... just heard your New York accent. <laughs> <laughs> it comes out from time to time. I'm Rochester. Still... <laughs> oh yeah, I love. That's a very nice school. A couple of my friends went to that school, so I, yeah. I'm very very familiar with that school. So. When did you know that, first of all, that you wanted to even get into lettering? Like, how did that part even, that shift happen? Yeah, I loved type. So I was like a traditional graphic designer, and I loved seeing a couple people who had taken typefaces and kind of made them their own. Mm. So I was like, maybe I should try that. (laughs) Um, And I just took an online course and fell in love with trying to make things look as close to they could on the computer in really crisp lines. And then it morphed into this, I mean, it became so popular that opportunities came up where I could just create things from scratch. And I Mm. never knew that illustration and graphic design could like find this sort of middle ground where letters could be the primary focus. So it was really just, I mean, it became popular. I saw it and I guess I didn't even know it was a thing really back right. in school. They didn't really talk about making your own type. Um, but I've always loved type. I definitely used to like doodle on all my pages and um, just had a real passion for things that were type focused. So, yeah. Okay, kinda. cool. Yeah, because I mean, like growing up, especially growing up and like, you're always like just drawing letters. I don't know. That was like the thing growing up, like just drawing mm-hmm letters bubble letters and all of that stuff and <laughs> <laughs> 
And now, so now look, it's like a, 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 a empire now. Lettering is like oh an it's, it's like an empire, and it's like afforded so mo- so much of us to like do some amazing projects. That is that is Seriously. awesome. That is awesome. It's, so, and there's so many different styles and so many different approaches, and there's there's definitely room for everyone, but it it is everywhere for sure. Yeah, that is the truth. So you are cur- you are from where? Where are you from? I'm from Rochester. Oh, are you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> born and raised. Um, so I I've done some traveling and I did uh, spend a summer in Burlington, Vermont. But that's pretty much the extent. I've lived in the same radius for a very long time. But I truly love the community here, and I I could go anywhere. But I I really do love where I am. So you're still in Rochester now. Yep. What is Rochester like? I've never met anyone <laughs> from Rochester. What is that like? I mean, there's a lot of art. There's a great community. There's, I mean, I try and think of that. People are like, oh, you're from New York. You must have been to Serendipity, which is that restaurant in New York City. Right. And I'm like, well, it's about six hours from this house. <laughs> um, but Rochester has a lot of like outdoor driven things. We truly have every season. And there's definitely a lot of artists, all different types. I mean, Kodak started here, so we have the George Eastman Museum. And we just have a really great community and network of other creative people. And I love that we have all the seasons, even though right now it's a blizzard, so it's not so great. But there's so many parks. We can go to the Adirondacks. We can really travel. And we go across the East Coast all year for my husband's biking. So we really get to see a lot of the East coast because we can drive anywhere, you know, Mm. we can get to the city, we can get to Connecticut, Mm. the Cape, we can get to so many places. So it's been, we we really love it. Nice. Nice. That's one thing I do remember about Rochester is the snow. Like when it snows, it snows. (laughs) Yeah. There's like our, you can't walk your dog right now. Our dog (laughs) is, you know, pretty big and he, he can't go in the snow and play in the backyard. It's too tall. It's like as tall as him. <laughs> Crazy. All right. So I noticed that as as I've said, you came out with this book, and I was it was very intriguing to me because of the title. <laughs> and I would like to know how this book came about and why you wanted to give it that title. So it's funny because I love the title too, but I can't take any credit because I had a different title and my publishers were like, did some focus groups and they changed it. So the title is Mind Your Business and I like it because it's a little sassy um, because it's a business book and my approach, basically I wanted to write a book. I didn't want to be an author necessarily. I didn't think of my, I'm not a writer. I just shared some tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. But I was in a sticky situation with a freelance client and I looked online and I was like, has anyone been through this? Mm. And no one had talked about it. And so I sort of set myself on a mission to share the highs and the lows and help other people find the right path for them. Because no, really no one was talking about like what happens if you have to go to small claims court mm. or what happens when a client fires you and like mm. there was just everyone was talking about the highs and nobody was talking about the the real journey and that there's no set path but there are tools and things you can learn along the way that will help you with a smoother transition to working for yourself mm-hmm. so I Two years ago, I had written all these notes down about it and I, I reached out to some publishers and was like I don't know, is this a good idea? And luckily I found a great team and they worked with me over the last year to get it to be a real tangible thing that people could use. And it just came out last week. So um, I I can't take any credit for the title. It's all them. They were, they did focus groups and um, I think they did a great job. That's awesome. That is awesome. So what was that process like? I know you said that you reached out to publishers. So what yeah. was that pop process like, even just trying to figure out how you were going to structure the book? So I spent the, like, six months beforehand, I thought about self-publishing, and I just, 
I felt like I had done some self-published projects before and I was like, that doesn't really appeal to me for this. I really want to reach a wider audience. I don't want to worry about production. And so I spent like a year sort of brainstorming, like what would I want to know? You know, what did my friends struggle with? And what questions have people asked me over the course of building my business and changing my business to, you know, like shifting my business to, to fit my needs. And so I had all these notes and basically I, I'm, and I'm going to teach an online course about this because this is my, like people are definitely really curious about it, but I put together a pitch that kind of covered what I wanted it to be, what a couple samples of from the quote unquote manuscript <laughs> and um, just like some visuals of what I wanted it to look like. So basically it's spec work and putting together my, you know, like I would pitch to a client, here's what I'm, I think it would be like. And I just got really, I won over a publisher that ended up being a perfect fit for me. Right. And, you know, I guess if that didn't work, I probably would have looked into self-publishing, but I'm really glad that it worked out the way it did. And it was a long process and one that I definitely didn't know anything about going into it. So finding the right team was really important. That's cool. That's cool. Because usually I know sometimes it, the, the most examples I've gotten is someone either self-publishing mm -hmm. or a publisher reaching out to someone. Yeah, that's great if a publisher reaches out to you. But I just sort of felt like that probably wasn't going to happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's pretty rare and you you probably need to have really created a almost a household name mm -hmm. and I recognize that I'm not a household name and that I'm still doing great work but I just felt like if I wanted it I needed to ask for it because how would people know that I wanted to write a book that's not sort of the nature of my business right. um, I mostly do surface design so those two don't really like naturally lend each other and I wasn't doing work like this I was doing branding and lettering, so this book was really quite different than the work I was showcasing. So I just asked for what I wanted, and I think that's true for most freelancers, that you need to go out there and you need to do outreach and you need to get your name in front of people because, like we said, this industry is saturated. So you have to get out there and get in front of those people who you want to see your work. And they'll probably love it, and if they don't, You'll find another client that's right, right for that's you. True. But I mean, like for a person like me, that's good to hear because I've talked to a couple other people, um, even like um, David Airy, the dude that um, wrote Logo Design Love. Like I was yeah. talking to him about like just his process and even finding the book. And he was like telling me like, oh, OK, they reached out to him. So I was just like, man, right. that's not happening to me. But he encouraged me, <laughs> like you know what I mean? But he encouraged me, and just to hear your situation now, it's like telling me, okay, it's another it's another alternative, because as you said, like, self-publishing is super daunting. Yeah, and it's possible. I've done um, a planner, like a day planner, mm -hmm. and yes, I sold that, that in my Etsy shop and on my, on my own website for the past, like, six years, and that's thousands of orders that I have to ship and I'm just not really set up to do that. I don't, I work from home and I like to work from home because I don't need that expense. And I just felt like that was a ton of work and I didn't really want to do it again with something, especially because you have limitations when you self publish, like what can it look like? How, how much can you afford? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do things like gold foil and that's expensive. <laughs> And I wanted the price point to be something that people could actually, like, they wouldn't have to second guess. They could just be like, I want this book, I'm going to read it. Where when you self-publish, it's more, it needs to be more expensive to cover your cost. Right, that's so just true. It's totally doable, and I've seen people, like, uh, the Hoodspot Sisters. Yep, yep. They self-publish, and their book is amazing, and I have it, and it's so valuable. But that was a huge undertaking for them, and I think it worked out for them for sure. So what would you say was the hardest thing that you had to overcome? Um, I thought about this. I think self-doubt is mm -hmm. the biggest one. I think we're really hard on ourselves. And we just get in our own way all the time. So I think just getting out of my own way and just going for it and 
realizing that it's not the worst case scenario it probably isn't the worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. So yeah, self doubt. That dang on self doubt. I mean, like <laughs> us creatives, I don't know. I don't know if it comes with the territory, but we struggle with that thing. Yeah, I think we compare ourselves yeah. to like my platform as a way to be more honest and to have fun and to share both sides of the story. And I wanted to do that with the book as well and to share that I'm a human being. And I definitely made that transition from being a brand that is, you know, a name to being just my own, just me as an illustrator. And my hope is that people will want to work with me for me and not, um, I, yeah, it was just a shift, and I think we're just so hard on ourselves, and it's really easy to fall down that rabbit hole yeah. all the time. No matter, like, what when you say, like, no matter how high this person may be perceived to the public, like, like almost everybody that I talk to, like, that's one, if it's not on the top, it's the top three on their list. And yeah. I'm like, this, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, someone said to me today, is you can have everything you want, or something like that. You can have everything you want and every all your desires, and you can still want more. <laughs> Very <laughs> you know? true. And I think that's kind of the fire of an entrepreneur is, like, if you don't want more, and it doesn't need, need to be, like, more followers or more clients. It can just mean, like, more out of something mm-hmm. or bigger or something different. I think if you don't have that fire, then you aren't cut out to be an entrepreneur because that fire is what drives you to get more clients or get a bigger job or to do work that is more fulfilling than what you did last week. And so I think that fire is is really important, but also really daunting. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So who would you say um, Ilana surrounds herself with? Who are, who are those, the support system? Yeah, um, my husband is, is pretty great. Um, he He's renovating our bathroom as we see. Um, when I graduated from art school, we were in the recession, and he was like, yeah, do your thing, freelance, but we got this. Like, we'll, we'll make the bills, you know, we'll, we'll be fine. Wow. And I never really realized what, uh, how empowering that was. I mean, he just had total confidence in me and was like, okay, great, like, you're going to be great, you know? And when we, when I left my full-time job as an art director, we sat down and made a plan, like when, when I wanted to leave, how much money I wanted to have saved up. So obviously he's great. And my parents, I have great parents. They're entrepreneurs, totally supportive. I learned so much from both of them. They're like my right and left brain. My dad is a lawyer, very organized, not organized. Uh, hopefully he's not listening. Sorry, Dad. Um, <laughs> but like strategic. Yeah. Strategic. <laughs> and my mom is creative and organized. And my sister is also an artist. So, I, I mean, I just, I'm blessed with an amazing family. But I definitely have other creative business owners that are sort of in similar boats to me. And that, even when you're really introverted, it's, really valuable to have those people and be able to call on them and say, Hey, even like a virtual mastermind, right. like, Hey, what do I do with this client? How should I respond? It's really, really important to have those people in yeah, your life. I, I agree to have at least a, a, a group of people that you could say, okay, you throw your work out to, or you're running into a, a situation or an issue that you could just throw yourself, throw, throw, yeah. throw it at them to kind of get feedback. I feel like, if you don't have that as a designer, you're really missing out. Yeah, especially because we look at our own work and we're like, yeah, that makes sense. But then you look from a different perspective and they're like, how did you miss that you spelled boat wrong? I don't know. <laughs> you spelled this wrong. Or like, I, I just have a couple, I have two mastermind groups that we don't pay anything. It's just a couple women meeting together on Skype like once. A month and we just talk about our problems and every single week we all just kind of walk away with like oh that really helped me actually or mm. oh that inspires me to do something and we support each other there's no like I said there's no money exchanged but we buy each other's products because we like them right, 
or we refer them to a client because we do different things. And so those are amazing. And they can be intimidating at first to be like, yeah, let's hop on a video call and just talk about life. (laughs) But then you walk away with so much valuable information. Yes, I totally agree. I'm a part of a few different groups. And I feel like that's like changed and helped my career like immensely. immensely. Totally. I love it. And shout out to your husband, spouses, <laughs> spouses out there. It's very important because there's something that you said, like it, it gave you this, this empowerment to know that he's like a hundred percent behind you. Like it really yeah. does something. I never even thought about it until recently. Like I was like, Oh my gosh, you did that for me. Like, <laughs> what if we didn't make the rent? And he was like, uh, he just like had, I guess, faith. And he's probably like overhearing this and being like, rolling his eyes or something um no but it was you know he just really never I I think it's really important to find someone who understands or to make sure you're communicating what your goals are and if you don't have someone who gets it or if money is really tight then you really need to put those really clear boundaries like I'm going to give it six months Mm -hmm. and I have enough that we can pay the rent for six months right because you really it's so up and down and you don't know what to expect and so to have that game plan is just so important and um i really hope that people do that with their families or with themselves i'm gonna give it six months i'm gonna have this much money saved up before i do it i mean no job is ever secure but if you can take some steps to give yourself some reassurance that this is a trial or if you can wean yourself into it i think that's a really good idea that's a true fact so what's the first hour of elana's day like So it used to be like a super slow morning and January 1st started working out at 5 a.m. Nice. Oh my God. I love it. (laughs) So we have a one-year-old and usually he, he's been my alarm clock for the past year. I just like wake up when he wakes up around seven and then it's like a mad dash to like shower while like one of us is watching him and get out the door or walk the dog. But I started going to the gym at five. I'm home and showered and done like 30 minutes of work by the time that the baby wakes up. And it is the best way to start my day. And honestly, if you asked me three months ago, like, would you ever wake up at five? I would absolutely, there's no way. So for all of you who are like late night, I, it's amazing. And I sleep better because I'm like, I literally have to go to bed right now. <laughs> like literally. <laughs> it's nine o'clock. Let's get the show on the road. Um, so it's, it's been really cool. We'll see if I keep it up for more than a month. But so far, I really like it. Uh, I'm there with That's you. A- I'm there with you. I made the shift like about a year and a half ago and I'm never turning back. Do you wake up with an alarm though or do you like wake up on your own now? Um, my, my internal alarm is probably about 630 to get up at five. I need the alarm clock. Yeah. There's no, I don't think I'll ever not need an alarm (laughs) and I need at least two also. And then my friend who I go to the gym with will text me and we'll make sure the other person is actually coming because we're not going alone. You can't go to the, I certainly can't get myself out of bed without like an incentive, like cookies or a friend or, you know, coffee. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm there with you. I used to do the multiple alarms, but what I do now is, as you know, most likely, I'm not sure if you, but my phone is my alarm. So I put it far away, far away, enough that I can hear it, but I have to get up to go turn it off. And that was a game game changer for me because the multiple alarms did not work. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. And then you check Instagram, and then you're just down the rabbit hole, and then it's like 30 minutes later, and you're like, oh, shoot, I missed my class. Um, yeah, I need to do that. That's, that was one of my resolutions for this this year, and I did it once. And it wasn't even, like, out of the bed. I could actually reach it. It was, like, it was like just on the corner of the room, so I could reach it if I stretched far enough. So maybe I'll try it today. It works. Probably. It works. I'll tell you, it works. That was a game changer for me. All right, yeah. so... Um, what's that thing that you can't live without that's not your phone? Okay, this is so hard. Is this an iPad, Cal? 
That's so bad. I mean, okay, for work purposes, I definitely need some, like, the iPad has been really great. But um, I feel like there's a couple things. In the Rochester weather, I need snow gear, like a fuzzy blanket or something, a down jacket. I asked my friend this question because I was like, what would you say? And she said everything but the bagel seasoning from Trader Joe's. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really, I'm a wa- cold water junkie. So I guess like my water bottle that like, keeps my ice frozen for like 12 hours at least. Wow. Nice. I'll take that. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say audible, but that's my phone. <laughs> uh, oh. I don't know what's yours. Uh, um, that is a good question. I, it's, it's crazy. Don't do that. <laughs> like, like, uh, man, there's always I'm a first a for something. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, that's what I would say. Probably but pencil and like a piece of paper. I'd be lying though, because usually I just use my Apple pencil. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Nice. There's a couple things, I guess. Nice. All right. So, uh, book recommendations. So, mind your business. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I have a couple. So, one is Steal Like an Artist. Have you read that one? Say it again. It's Steal Like an Artist. No, never. So, it's more like a coffee table book, but it's sort of about how you can be inspired by other people, and you, no matter what you do, you'll take, you'll take all the people you're inspired from and make your own version of that. And I thought that was really cool. The other one is Essentialism. I've heard of that one. But I that one's really good because I feel like that helped me make a major shift in my business when I was like feeling frustrated and anxious about clients. I really shifted to do work that felt just really happy and really like a better fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other one, which I think is really good, is called You Are a Badass. And I've... it's just like happy and empowering. But I read books, like, I read a lot of books. So I could probably list a lot more. I'll take that one. Yeah. Nice. All right, so what's next? What's next for Lana? So that's a really good question. Um, I'm coming off the high of having my book be out in the world, and... I've been getting a couple of requests to do like an online course. I'm doing a a sort of book tour and I'm doing a workshop that goes with the book where you go like a little bit deeper. So I think I'm going to do an online course and I think I'll also do one about how to publish, how to like get a book published or Mm -hmm. things like that. Otherwise I'm focused on surface design and licensing. And then I am hoping to do more, just creating for the sake of play and right. like trying new things and like exploring new methods and just trying to like up my style and find, just continue to find my voice. So I, yeah, just have fun and explore more with with texture and, and different letter forms and see where it takes me. I'm there with you with the, especially with the just create and just to create. Like hard. We, we don't have the time to do that. And there's always yeah. there's always something. There's always something and it's usually your best work that comes out of creating just for fun. But we all have really busy lives and it's it's definitely hard. And the people who do create just for fun, I'm like, Do you do other things for fun? <laughs> or like when do you sleep? And so I definitely definitely wanna work on that this year is like I used to do that all the time is I would just make stuff to make stuff. And especially with having a baby last year, I feel like it's time to get back to having play and just exploring more. And that's always the hardest part is when you're starting to experiment. It's like you feel like you're really bad at it. And so you just have to keep doing keep it. Going. And then eventually you'll be good at it or you'll feel comfortable. So I'm at the beginning stages where I'm like, I don't want to do it because I suck at it. <laughs> so hopefully I'll feel a little better about that in a couple months. Yeah, I'm there with you. I'm trying to uh, bought a course on um, Udemy. I'm trying to yep. um, step my 
UX UI game up. Huh. So, so uh, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be great. I mean, I love taking classes on Skillshare just to even see how someone else works. Like, right. it's always cool to be like, wait, I don't use that tool or things like that. And um, I think always be learning is really important to just, like, try something new and, you know, take a take a class that's different just for fun. But as far as UX and UI, I break my website every time I try and publish a blog post. So I won't be trying that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It, it's, yeah. it's a lot. It's a, just, yeah. just hearing just the whole theory and everything behind it. Like, yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. So on that note, what advice would you have for creatives out there? I think one of my best or something I say a lot, I guess, is that do it with passion or not at all. Because I think when you're not passionate about something, it's not fun. And so why do something and why put in 80 hours a week into something that you don't actually enjoy? And yeah, I just think it loses all its fun. And that should be the most important thing is to to have fun. I think for most of us creatives, we, we feel like our job needs to be both fulfilling and inside and outside, like personally fulfilling and professionally fulfilling. And so have fun and do it with passion. And if it's not, find something to do on the side that can bring you that. Yeah, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. Like, for example, this podcast, like I enjoy talking to people. Right. But I don't like the editing. It's intense. Like <laughs> it's it's intense. So yeah, I'm working on that. Um, uh, my brother does stuff like that, so I'm trying to That's get awesome. him get him over to to uh, help me out with that. He came for the Christmas holidays, and we had a good talk. So we'll see how that goes. That's but awesome. it's, it's if if it was the other way around, if it was me enjoying editing but not really like talking to people. Like, I wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be fun. Like, it would be yeah. really... Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I don't like taxes, but I do them anyway. Right, because, exactly. <laughs> you know, and so I think there's some parts of your job that you're not going to like, but if you can limit those to being the minority, then right. that's a great step in the right direction. And the, the other thing is that eventually as you grow, you'll be able to delegate. And so right. as you grow and as you put in the time and as you put in the work and you keep doing it, It'll either get easier or you'll be able to outsource or delegate or partner with someone or find a better solution. Um, And so, you know, part of it is like putting in the time. The other part is figuring out the best way to make your life fulfilling. Right. And if it's, you know, if it's not, then that's a whole nother story. Right, right. So So where can people go to learn more about you, all the awesome stuff that you're doing? Yeah, so Mind Your Business is available on Amazon. And if you get it, leave a review because that would really be wonderful. And if it's like a one-star review, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, And I'm at Alana Grisso on all my social media. And that's um, with an I, which I know is weird. Um, And yeah, I spend most of my time on Instagram. And I love connecting with other creatives. This was so much fun. Nice. I really enjoyed it, man. Um... This has been a blast. This has been a blast. Um, thank you again, Alana, for coming on. Um, yeah. I really appreciate it, but I'm going to let you go. But thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. I really appreciate you taking the time out. I hope, you know, you got something from it that it brought you value and you know, you were able to pull something, some key tips, some key practices that can help you to take your career to the next level and just to elevate your mindset in general. Um, if you want to learn about everything that I'm doing, you can go to dpcreates.com. That's D as in dog, P as in Peter, creates.com. Or go to the podcast website. That's passion behind theart.com Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. Be blessed.